Uh, here we have a composer, when I ask him what his most wonderful experience so far is, can only think of experiences that are still ahead. And experience including his determination to ensure that the complete audience that he will be working for shortly will have a complete minute of absolute silence engineered by some of his accomplices spread throughout that audience. Uh, so here we have a composer, for instance, who looks back with great pleasure on the one time that he managed to have his complete audience blindfolded. Uh, don't worry, I don't think it's going to happen tonight. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, this is probably enough to convince you that we have somebody with very, very special and unusual talents with us. A very nice person, a very nice way to compliment the wonderful list of speakers that we have already had yesterday and today. So, with great pleasure, I give you Merlijn Twaalfhoven. Thank you so much, and thank you all for precious time, precious minutes. Well, when I was on the conservatory and uh, educated as a composer, of course, the big dream is to create a masterpiece. Uh, but the competition is very, 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 very fierce. Uh, for example, with Beethoven or Tchaikovsky. <laughs> and until now, I, I might not have succeeded in creating a masterpiece. And I am actually pretty convinced that I might not succeed at all in life. Um, but the reason uh, that I'm not very sad or very frustrated uh, being here is actually because about 10 years ago, I traveled to Cyprus. And Cyprus is a wonderful island, but with a very tra tragic history. And the whole island is cut in, in, in half. And I saw this situation, and I thought the only thing that is free to move is the air. And music uses the air. So I felt suddenly responsible of doing music in Cyprus, and actually in the capital of Nicosia. And I, I worked in uh, a year involving 400 people, and finally we put musicians on rooftops, on balconies, in the streets, children's choirs, a soprano on a balcony, some, some dancers even. Um, there were people banging big oil vessels, but all, also members of the Philharmon Philharmony who had to, yeah, to, to, to play their trumpets on the top of a building. And it was, well, a big piece, very complex way of, of working, because musicians, usually they look at a conductor, you know, and now they could hardly see each other, let alone hear a coherent thing. Uh, I used, I gave them clocks. They all had to look <laughs> at clocks, and I tried to synchronize it all. And uh, in, the, in the, their sheets, it was mentioned, at that time, at that second, you need to play this sound. And um, then people came to me, look, we're Cypriots. <laughs> you come from the Netherlands. You know <laughs> things with <the> clocks. <laughs> so we re rehearsed it at dawn. And then at noon, we did it again. And at dawn, everyone was late. At noon, half of them were late. And then at, <laughs> at, the, at the sunset, we did it. And it was well, amazing, but also confusing, because it didn't all go the way I, 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 I composed it or the way, the way I created it. I, halfway, I had to let go, in some way, of the sense of control, because I couldn't conduct them, you know? They had their clocks and their sheets. <laughs> so, well, after it, I was actually anxious to hear the reactions of the, the, the people, because it was not a typical music performance, let alone a masterpiece. So, and then people talk, talk to me, they say, they were moved. And not because of the music, because they were at a place next to this buffer zone that really represented a big tragedy. And they always feel angry when they are in that place because of the past, because of everything, that, the whole history. And they, they said like, okay, there was a, something happening with music and I could be there for an hour without getting anger. Uh, and I just was there, and I, I heard sound from the other side. I heard the sound of some, like some a rooster uh, the, or some, some, some animals, some work in a factory, the sounds of, of the city. 
And that touched me a lot because actually I finally could feel the present or in some way reality. And this presence was something they, they couldn't experience before in this sense of, in this, this area of a conflict. And because they could experience the presence and there is no war at that presence, they could also have a hope for a future. So I was, uh, well, it actually turned my world around. <laughs> before I thought I should create things and artists should create beautiful things, maybe a masterpiece. But then I became aware that the most, most, most important thing is to create attention, sensitivity, and in some way, openness, space. And openness is actually a scary thing. I believe, um, well, maybe uh, 100,000 years of evolution teach us to make judgments as soon as possible. If we see a creature, we say like, okay, we have to run now, or we have to get it because otherwise there is no dinner tonight. So you have to make a very quick decision uh, in the jungle. And uncertainty is a, a bit a scary thing, and there is a only a few people who feel comfortable to look behind the surface, to see that things might have, are complex, more complex than you think at once. And people who have, who have a curiosity, and we might, well, we call them artists. <laughs> and. <laughs> That society says, oh, that's lovely. Uh, you can deal with that. We outsource our insecurity. Uh, we give you a space. We build you a museum. We keep you on an arm's length and, and uh, lovely. Uh, do what you need to do. And we can enjoy that. And we can feel very secure in our, our seats and see something disturbing on a safe distance. And then we go home, and it's all the rational world where we deal and we know our environment, we can trust what we, what we see around. And I believe it's not just a missed opportunity to outsource the irrational and your, actually, the, the whole worlds of your feelings and emotions. No, it even can be a tragedy. I mean, we are not rational beings. We are full of emotions, full of um, um, irrational things. Well. Maybe very practical. Um, to, to, I, I, I spoke about a place of um, art building in a, in a building, like a, a nice concert hall, beautiful museums. Um, that's a, yeah, it's, it's very, very, very clear to where to put it. But the question is, who is deciding, well, um, what to do there and why to do it and how to build that relationship? Well, we talk about that. Another way to organize our society is to place art in a certain time slot. To say, okay, we have time for work, we have time for sleep, and there is a time for art. Some people listen to an audio book in their way in traffic, you know? It's lovely. They, they found their moment. But this moment is full of competition from the entertainment industries. It's really also, well, a fight for attention. And I want to propose or to share a thought of a third way of a place where we can use the force of art as a, yeah, a power for transformation. And that is actually anywhere where we need openness. So as soon as in a, in a company or anywhere you are stuck in a development or whatever, art can help or art can relate to these moments of insecurity, even in relationship, on professional level or even personal level. And on, on schools, I mean, we expect teachers to really teach uh, and to, to be convinced of the, the truth of what they teach, but to teach the right to doubt and to actually ask questions instead of just producing answers. I mean, that's a big, big, big power that we very often forget. So I, I hope, I mean, I look for somebody or if, Few of you maybe like to explore that possibility to really find, well, uh, ways to, to bring uh, the transformative power of arts to, to unknown places, places where we are not used to actually uh, allow art and to create space and to, to, yeah, to start doubting and, well, maybe together, because I can't do that alone, we might, well, create a society that is 
open and has, has a kind of a, a, a power and that we might call, finally, a masterpiece. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you.